Swamp Thing. He's an adventuring vegetable who can communicate with plants. This is something that only happens in comics. Plants don't think or feel or communicate, right? Actually. I'm the Fansplainer, and I'm here to put comics in context. This is the first in a three-part series about Alan Moore's Saga of the Swamp Thing. First, the origin story. Laboratory, explosion, superpowers. It's familiar, but uh, this lab was in a swamp. Swamp Thing was created by Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson in 1971, and Alan Moore took over writing the comic in 1984. And Alan Moore introduced this concept of the green. Uh, it's like a, a mystical plane that connects all plant life. And Swamp Thing can use this to uh, perceive things through other plants or control other plants. And it sounds kind of comic booky and metaphysical, but in a way, it's scientifically true. Plants are perceiving and communicating all the time. A few examples. So, a long time ago in Africa, um, the stubby little giraffes would eat acacia leaves and the acacia trees grew taller, so the giraffes grew taller. So the uh, acacia trees grew thorns, so the giraffes grew long, blue, twisty tongues to get around the thorns. So then the acacia trees started doing this thing where they could detect when the buds were getting nibbled on and use that as a signal to start pumping tannins into the buds, and these tannins taste terrible to the giraffes. So the giraffes just uh, eat until they taste bad and then move to a different tree. But this is where it gets like really weird and interesting because the acacia trees have developed this ability to release allelochemicals, this signal. And when they start pumping the tannins to the buds, it has a smell to it that triggers other acacia trees to start pumping their own tannins. So that when the giraffe goes over there, it also tastes bad. So now you can see giraffes galloping upwind to try to outrun this like signal communication, this scent between the acacia trees. I smell freshly mown grass. That's an allelochemical. Grass reacts to the trauma of getting cut by releasing this band-aid compound to seal in moisture. And it has a smell to it that makes the other blades of grass nearby start pumping their own band-aid compound to get ready for some impending trauma. Uh, so that smell that we all like, that's actually like the grass is screaming. There's someone else who gets her power from the green, Poison Ivy. She uses her power over plants to mind control other characters to make them fall in love with her. And it's kind of like this orchid. Uh, it grows a, an appendage that looks like a female bumblebee's butt. And then male bumblebees come and see it and start humping it. And they get the pollen all over them and then they're disappointed and they go somewhere else and they see another female bumblebee butt and they start humping that, but that's another orchid thing. And so that's how that orchid pollinates itself. Why is caffeine so stimulating and addictive? One hypothesis is that caffeine evolved in the coffee flower so that bees would remember which flower they got the nectar from and keep coming back to it for more. Brussels sprouts don't like to get chewed on by baby caterpillars, so what they do when they sense the caterpillar eggs is produce this like warning call that attracts pregnant wasps. These predatory wasps inject their eggs into the caterpillar eggs, and the wasp eggs hatch first and eat their way out, solving the Brussels sprouts problem. Maybe you already knew about plant pheromones. That's why I saved the best example for last. See, when Alan Moore made up the green in the 80s, he didn't know that 20 years later, scientists would discover that trees are actually talking to each other all the time. There's this thing called the wood wide web. It's not a mystical supernatural plane. It's a symbiotic fungus, and it connects all of these trees together through their roots so that they can communicate with each other. One tablespoon of forest soil contains just miles and miles of these little white fungal fibers. And trees pay a tax of about 30% of their energy to this fungus. And in exchange, the fungus acts like an internet for the whole forest. And so if one tree has a, a bark beetle infestation or something, you can tell the other trees, hey, start pumping tannins to ward off this pest. Or if one tree is really thirsty, it can tell the other trees like, hey, 
hold on to your water because we might be headed for a drought or something. But it goes beyond just sharing information because the trees will also share nutrients with each other. They'll share things like phosphorus and nitrogen or carbon chains, which means that all of these neighbors are literally borrowing sugar from each other all of the time. Professor Suzanne Samard and her team were doing research here in the Pacific Northwest, and they found that there are mother trees that favor their own offspring. But even trees that aren't related will spread the wealth around. So a big, healthy tree that gets a lot of sunlight will share resources with some of those smaller, younger trees that are in the shade. And then when the big, healthy trees are old and they can't photosynthesize, the younger trees will pay it back through the roots, like taking care of elderly parents. Why do trees do this? I mean, I thought nature was all about survival of the fittest, right? Well, trees benefit from community. They literally lean on each other. Their intertwined roots provide all sorts of structural support. So trees basically invented social security millions of years ago. And it's not even just within one species. Samard's team used radioactive carbon isotopes to trace this transfer through the forest. They found that Douglas firs, which are evergreen and can continue to photosynthesize in the winter, were sharing some of their energy in the winter with paper birch trees. And then paper birch trees in the summer, when they had all their leaves out, would pay it back. So all of this sharing, is that conscious reciprocity? I'm a little skeptical. It benefits the fungus to diversify its assets, right? So if one type of tree uh, gets sick one year, it can rely on another species of tree. But I think we're really quick to view nature as a story about competition, right? It's uh, survival of the fittest, red in tooth and claw, as Darwin said. But maybe we overlook the importance of cooperation. In the mycorrhizal network, it's not zero sum. Everybody benefits. So anyway, Swamp Thing. I framed all of these anecdotes as examples of plants communicating with each other and protecting each other, the way that Swamp Thing can tap into the green. But does that mean the plants are really thinking? I think it depends on how you define thinking. In your human brain, you have neurotransmitters. You have serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, those are a few. Plants and fungi have serotonin, dopamine, and glutamate. Your neurons fire across synapses with electrochemical sensors. Root tips communicate with electrochemical sensors. Roots can steer through the soil. Experiments have shown that they can detect gravity, moisture, pressure. They can actually hear the sound vibrations of running water and steer towards it. They can taste pockets of nutrients or toxins and avoid them. So if a plant is taking in information from its senses and using that to make decisions, isn't that behavior? I'm not saying that trees are conscious in the same way that we are. We're just so biologically different. But maybe it's worth thinking about consciousness not as this binary thing where either you have it or you don't, uh, but as a spectrum. We went from talking about plant communication to talking about consciousness. Which brings me to the topic of our next episode. It's gonna be about how Swamp Thing grows these tubers out of his body. And if you eat one, it gives you a psychedelic trip. So that's gonna be all about like the science of psilocybin. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you should probably get off the internet, go take a walk in nature, uh, or we can have a fertile discussion in the comment section. If you want some reading recommendations, I left those in the description. And if you felt nourished by this video and you want to reciprocate, you can go to my fungal funding network over on Patreon. And if you want more Fansplainer episodes for more comics and context, subscribe to me!